Hi, I'm Paul King, and tonight we're going to be looking at Roebling's Monongahela Bridge, and my focus tonight will be on the history portion of the presentation, and I am an architect and a full-time professor at New York City College of Technology in downtown Brooklyn, just in the shadow of the Brooklyn Bridge. Hi, I'm Marty Johnston, and tonight I'm going to talk about the physics of Roebling's suspension bridges. And uh, I'm a professor of physics at University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. I typically work in nonlinear dynamics, but I'm interested in seeing applications of physics in history. Good evening. It's good to be back in front of the SAE audience again for another online event. Tonight, we're going to look at collaborative work of a physicist, Dr. Marty Johnson from the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, and myself. Paul King, I'm a professor of architecture from New York City College of Technology in the shadow of the Brooklyn Bridge. As you may know from my previous presentations, my perspective is that of a historian. And I look at the work of John Roebling in the context to the development of suspension bridges in the 19th century, and also look for the connections between the way he built his different bridges. The goal of this work is to try to understand what engineers of the time understood about the behavior and motion of the bridges they were building. To do so requires three perspectives, that of a historian, that of a physicist, and that of an engineer. In simplistic terms, while a physicist will look to understand what is happening and work to find exact answers, they often work in an idealized environment where the weight or mass or the friction of components is not always considered an engineer, is looking to build, and while engineers also seek exact understanding, they build in safety factors in their designs to account for those things that they cannot predict. Tonight, we will focus on the first two, history and physics. I would also like to, in advance, thank Dario Gasparini, an engineer who was good enough to meet with us in advance of tonight's presentation to provide some insight into the views of the engineer and also confirm that we're on the right track. So we begin, we began. So we began with questions. And as our questions grew exponentially, we recognized that suspension bridges in general and Roebling's Monongahela Bridge in particular right, are much more complex than we thought. So we're going to be addressing only a few of the questions that came to us. I would also like to mention that while we see this as a that we see this as a long-term collaboration. And we've already begun to recognize that we're likely to have an impact upon how physics is taught in Marty's college. So let's begin with the history. So Roebling was in the middle of, middle of building a, a suspension aqueduct, his very first bridge in Pittsburgh in 1844. By 1845, May, this is opening up. And a month before that in April, a fire sweeps through Pittsburgh and burns down the Monongahela Bridge, which was a wooden covered bridge. As a result, left behind were these piers. And so what Roebling did is 11 days after the fire, right? he had already gotten a proposal accepted and moved his men and his machines from the aqueduct across town to begin construction on the Monongahela Bridge. And so it opened about a year later, but it actually opened a little bit earlier in 1845, really on New Year's Day. The entire river froze and people were stranded on the other side when the ferries couldn't make it to the other side. And Roebling became a local hero when he temporarily opened the bridge for passage for people to get home. So the bridge officially opened a month later in February 1845, after nine months of construction, cost around $55,000. And in this particular case, the spans of the bridge were predetermined at 188 feet based on the location of the existing piers. So on the top image, you see Roebling's Allegheny Aqueduct in Pittsburgh. And below that, you see the Monongahela Bridge. And the conditions of the two are the similar because the aqueduct was also the replacement of an existing bridge. And as a result, the spans were predetermined. But for the multi-span aqueduct, right? The weight on each span was relatively equal, even as a boat was to travel across, as it necessarily displaced an equal weight of water to stay afloat. 
Now, by comparison at the Monongahela Bridge, Roebling had a different and more difficult and complex problem to deal with. This time, the great weight would be concentrated on a single span and switching from one to the next as a load traveled across. To balance these moving loads, Roebling added diagonal stays and a unique bell crank pendulum system hanging from cast iron towers. Just some quick specs on the bridge. So the entire length of the bridge was 1500 feet long. There were eight spans of 188 feet. It was held up by 16 separate suspension cables, each four and a half inches in diameter with 750 parallel wires in each cable. So just to give you an idea of the complexity of the problem. So as you have a load moving, say from left to right, one of the problems with the way that bridges are typically done is there are saddles on top of the towers that are on rollers. And if weight were to come down, say on span number four, it might push, right? Or that span to lower and the others to move. So there's a potential problem with multi-span suspension bridges, which is occurring because of the shifting of the cables. And Roebling knew that this was an issue. And so he experimented with this unusual system of pendulums hanging from the towers and he's using this system, which we're gonna look at a little bit today to try to navigate this problem of how to deal with a moving load across a multi-span suspension bridge. And just a quote from uh, Dario. So for multi-span bridges, the effects of unequal live loads on adjacent spans must be considered in the design of intermediate towers and bearings. So left-hand side is an updated drawing that was done later on. The truss actually is different than the truss as it was originally built by Roebling. But you will see the cast iron towers and a little bit of the connection of a suspension cable. The right-hand side is a little bit more correct. That's my own drawing. So if you look at the towers very carefully, you'll see how a suspension cable comes in, is hung by a vertical pendulum or bell crank bar. There's then a horizontal bar extending off to the side with a cast iron shoe for connecting to the next suspension cable. Also hanging from the lower portion of that pendulum is another bar that then holds what are referred to as the diagonal stays of the bridge. And so here you can see uh, marking the suspension cable in yellow on the left. Also note that the cable is angled. On the right-hand side, it's actually the anchor chains that go to the anchorage. And then this is an indication of the position of the diagonal stays, but this is a diagram at an anchorage. And we're going to look at a condition more at a tower. So just to clarify one point, which is Roebling used what we call a hybrid bridge design. Now a hybrid bridge is designed where the suspension cable holds up the deck by a combination of the vertical suspenders as well as the diagonal stays. And Roebling's thinking behind the reason why he used this was that the uh, stays were fastened by small wrappings to these suspenders. And essentially his point is that you're making a triangular form and he says a triangular form, right? The triangle is the only geometrical figure whose corners cannot be shifted consequently by keeping those stays under good tension, we form so many stationary points in the flooring as we have stays. Now he writes this in 1855 when he's doing the Niagara Railway Bridge, which is really his first true suspension bridge because what he didn't do here is the stays can move independent of the suspenders. And in this bridge, he did not tie them together. So essentially he's not creating fixed triangles the way he intends to in his future suspension bridges. So it's his first suspension bridge, but not quite. Okay. So again, that's a look at the bridge. So we're gonna focus on a single span. And if you look at it from above, you can see how the cables are curving in towards the middle. So these mean these, they are inclined, meaning that the distance between the cables at the center of a span is closer together than they are at the towers. All right. So there's three conditions that we're going to consider today. One is the swing of a pendulum that happens at a tower, the curve of a cable, which is going to be the one particular condition that Marty's going to examine in detail as far as the physics goes. 
And then the third is what happens at the anchorage, because we recognize that since the anchorage is pinned on the left-hand side with rigid long iron bars as opposed to a suspension cable, we know that that pendulum is, pendulum is gonna behave in a different fashion than one at a particular tower. So these are the drawings. These are Roebling's original drawings. And on the left-hand side, right, as I said, you have the anchor chains that extend up. And then this is the position of the suspension cables, right? And in orange, you can see the pendulums and all the different views. And then the stays. So the stays, again, are sort of acting independent of the suspenders and are acting independent of that suspension cable, right? Now, like all good ideas, it was borrowed from Mark Brunel. And Roebling writes about this in his specification. He says, the arrangement, which has been applied by Brunel in several instances, will preserve the stability of the spans in all cases, no matter if any of them are overloaded or not. The equilibrium between adjoining spans will by this means always regulate itself without ever endangering stability of the cast iron columns or of the piers. So a couple other questions come up because this is part of my process, which is that often when I'm investigating things, I'm looking into the specifics of things. And one of the things that occurred to us, and it's a little hard to get from this one drawing, was the question of whether or not, because the condition is, if you look on the top drawing, you have a pendulum and then you have a suspension cable that comes to the base of the next pendulum. So on the left-hand side, you've got a horizontal bar. So the bridge, in a sense, is left-handed or right-handed, depending upon your perspective. And when you get to the last span, the question is, is there still a horizontal bar? And after coming up with this question on Monday in conversation with Marty and with Dario, I did a little further research and I found in Roebling's drawings the note that says that there are 18 pendulums, but only 14 connecting links. And what that means is that the length of the suspension cables in one of the spans is actually longer by the length of that horizontal bar than they are in any other span. So we're going to go on now and start to talk about the physics and look at the cable. I'm going to hand this over to Marty. So I met Paul this summer. I'm not a bridge guy. And we met at the conference and we had a great conversation. He said, hey, Marty, would you, would you be interested in getting involved in looking at some bridge physics with me? And I said, that sounds kind of interesting. So I started looking at these pictures and here is this picture and it's a complicated picture. And as you see in what Paul has been talking about, there's lots and lots of details. And as a physicist, I'm like, my experience with bridges has been more intuitive than the pictures than historical. I grew up in Northwest Montana. So here's the suspension bridge I remember growing up on, bouncing across that 50 feet above the water, a couple hundred feet long. And you look at that, it's a very different curve. The deck is curved. It's not as useful as the flat bridges that Roebling is building. But that's the picture in my head when I think about a suspension bridge. As a physicist, that's what I see today. So what I'm gonna do is strip out some of these details. And the first thing as I was looking at this and talking with Paul, it's kind of overwhelming. All these particular details that engineers have been working on for hundreds of years to figure out. And I'm like, how do I, what do I see? So this is where I'm gonna start. And as I, as I look at this, I like to start, when I start thinking about a problem, what am I trying to do? I wanna keep as simple as possible and I need to build up an understanding. So rather than going to the details instantly, I've got to kind of get a big picture. My explanations need to go beyond pictures and words, however. I need to get math built in. As I build that in, I want to translate the ideas that have been developed in, in engineering and translate that back into the language of physics as much as possible. And I can't get away from mathematics. So a little bit of this tonight, we're, gonna, we're going to go with the simplest math I can, but it's gonna involve some basic calculus and some ideas that go upon that. And the other piece as an experimental physicist, it's not just enough for me to think about making mathematical models, I wanna see if they work. So those are my goals. So where does this start? So 
I'm looking, the first thing I want to know is what's the shape? So one of the things, if I walk down the hallway and I talk to my colleagues and I ask, what's the shape of a hanging cable? It's a classic problem in physics to discuss. And we all know the answer because we've done it in the past and it's a hyperbolic cosine. So I'm reading through the material that Paul gives me and they don't talk about hyperbolic cosines, they talk about parabolas. So I'm like, what's going on um, right off the bat? What I know doesn't, doesn't follow. So the first thing I need to do is go back and ask myself, what's the shape of this cable? And why is my intuition different from what the engineering record says? So I'm gonna start again, these things are complicated. As Paul said, I'm gonna strip out the details and try to idealize this piece. So on the left is my idealized cable, it's uniform. On the right is something a lot more complicated. When I think about an idealized cable, I'm thinking about a system that's it's uniform material, it's not stretchable, it's frictionless and it's flexible. Code words in physics, when we say things like heavy, that means we need to take into account a mass. So when I say a heavy cable, that means the cable's mass is important. When I say a light cable, basically it means the cable doesn't have any mass and doesn't, it has no functionality within F equals MA. So where does this story start? It's an old question. Galileo walked up during the Inquisition is working, writing on day four of his dialogues. He is interested in understanding motion and, and, and arguing that, that the trajectories are parabolic. And he is notices that if I stretch a cord, it approximates a parabola. Now, some historians have used that statement to say that Galileo had it wrong, but actually he was thinking about this likely in terms of using the stretched cord as an early analog computer to understand what's going on trajectories. It's a few years later that Bernoulli comes along and solves the problem and comes up with the hyperbolic cosine. And I wanna go back and see, okay, how do, I, how do I understand this from a simple point of view? So to begin with, what determines shape is the tensions in the cable. And what is gonna happen because that cable can bend, it follows the tension. And I have two different ways. And the physicist, when we think about this problem, we usually are thinking about a uniform heavy cable where the only piece in the system is the cable. An engineer says, that's not so useful, I need a deck. And typically in that case, it's a uniform deck, which is different from the uniform cable. If you look at the picture on the left, the uniform cable is bent, the uniform deck is flat and horizontal. So as I go on the left-hand side, the mass changes with, as I move along from left to right. But when I go on the right-hand side, that uniform deck, the mass would be constant as I move along. What, and what I'm curious, what do those things tell me about the tension in the system? And how do things change? So first of all, let's build up our picture by thinking about a light cable. So here I have a mass, a load of M naught hanging from a light cable. And if you remember when I say light cable, what that means is I can ignore the cable. So if we go back to our Newton's laws, we draw a free body diagram, that area in that blue oval is the area I'm interested in analyzing. And so I'm taking that a picture on the right is a free body diagram that says, what's the mass enclosed inside that oval? Well, it's just basically M naught. The cable doesn't have anything to do with it. If I draw my free body diagram and I include more of the cable, it doesn't change anything. So my picture M is a constant, it's M naught, it's just the load. So when I write out Newton's laws for that, F equals MA, these are vector equations, so I have to think about things both in the in x and in y. And in this case, I'm using y as the as the vertical axis. There's no acceleration. I'm thinking about a static system. All those forces have to equate, and that zero comes from the tension going up and m naught g going down. And I solve that, and I say the tension in that cable is m naught g. No matter where I look in that cable the tension stays constant. And so the big takeaway, when I think about a light vertical cable, the tension in the system doesn't change. If I do the same problem, but I have a heavy cable, now as I look at that system, the piece, that oval, that's the piece that I'm analyzing is going to change. And I have the M not enclosed in there, but there's also the piece of the cable that's inside that picture. 
And as I make that picture bigger and bigger, the mass of the cable that's included in my system gets bigger and bigger. So how do I take that into account? Well, I still start from the same place. F equals MA is equal to zero. But now in this case, I have to include the mass of the cable. And when I look at the mass of the cable, I'm assuming a linear tape cable. So the important idea is the mass of the cable is going to be the properties in that cable, which are gonna be the density of the cable and the length of that cable. So however much length I have times the density is the mass of that enclosed cable. Now here's the important takeaway. The important takeaway is unlike our earlier picture, the tension changes as I move up the cable. So just hanging in a heavy cable, the tension is no longer constant. So we've looked at a fairly straightforward one dimensional system. And the first thing we see is when we have a heavy cable, tension has to be taken into account. It's a changing thing. So now I'm gonna look at this as a two dimensional. I'm gonna get a little bit more complicated and say, all right, how does that tension behave if it's a two dimensional system? So here I've taken that upper piece, I've just wrapped my cable along there and I'm looking at a piece of the cable and a little segment of it. And the important piece here is that I have three forces acting on that segment of cable. I have the mass times gravity going down. I have the tension not to the left that's at the bottom of the cable. So that's just a horizontal force that's keeping that segment in place. And those two forces are balanced by the tension coming up at an angle. If I look at those hypothetically, I can just see a free body diagram instead of a one dimensional free body diagram. I have a two dimensional free body diagram where I now have an angle to worry about. The important piece to take away from this picture is that that tension going off to the right, that angle is determined by the tangent going along there, dy and dx. And that's gonna be an important piece in the next, and as we look at the, the forces that make up this segment. So now let's take and do Newton's laws and apply them to this particular statement. Now we have to do it in the X and we're gonna to have to do it in the Y. So let's take a look at the X to begin with. I have a piece of that tension going up, but there's a piece of that tension that's horizontal, T times cosine theta gives me that horizontal component. If you think back to your high school trig, T naught's going the opposite direction. And I can think of that cosine back to the picture we had on the other piece, cosine adjacent over hypotenuse is gonna be dx divided by ds. So I've replaced the cosine with dx over ds. I do the same thing on the y. The difference is instead of cosine, I now have to talk about sine and I'm balancing the vertical component of t, which is just ty, which is t sine theta, and that's balanced by mg going down. Those two separate statements, they come out of, of, of Newton's laws or vector relationships. So I get one equation for every axis that I'm looking at. I can take those two equations and I can combine them. And they give me a differential equation that describes dy dx as a function of the mass in my system. And this is a simple picture that I have a differential equation that describes a segment of the cable. With that one idea, I can take apart these two different bridge structures. So let's do that. So in the first case, I'm thinking about the classic catenary where there's no deck and I'm just hanging a cable, in which case the mass goes along in the arc and it's a uniform mass in that cable and, my, and I treat it as a uniform mass times a distance, which is just gonna be some lambda times S, where S is the arc, is a, and it's gonna change as I move along in the X and the Y. When I put that into my differential equation down on the lower left, and I solve it, it's a little bit of a nasty thing to solve, but I end up with a hyperbolic cosine. And that's the equation that describes the classic catenary. If I do the uniform mass that is distributed horizontally, Instead of being a function of the arc, it's just a function of x as I walk along the deck, it turns out to be a much simpler differential equation, and it gives me the equation of a parabola. And that's the one the engineers are using because what they're doing is they're using a loaded deck. They don't worry just about the cable. They'd like to actually have something useful. 
So right off the bat, I learned something I didn't know, which was, oh, when I put a bridge together, there's a reason that they talk about in, in Roebling's notes where they talk about parabolic curves because they weren't hyperbolic cosines. You put a loaded bridge on and that's something new. I walked down the hallway, none of my colleagues know either. So for engineers, the civil engineers are gonna know this is in, right off the bat, but the rest of us are learning this as we go. The important piece here is that the distribution of mass controls the shape that the cable takes. So how do those look differently? So on the left, you see a hyperbolic cosine curve in, in, in brown and a parabolic curve that go, both of those curves are going through the same, coming from the same tops of a pier, going through the same pieces. And you can see that they're different. The hyperbolic cosine is a little flatter than the parabola. And I take a look and I see that it's hard when I put them separately to see the difference. But what's kind of neat is when I, so being experimentalist, I had to see, does this actually work? So I went and got a bunch of bead chain and I hung it in my office. And if I, if you look, you'll notice there's a little white line. That white line is actually a silver of the beads and it lines right up with the hyperbolic cosine, just like we would hope. And all I did there was fit the corners. I didn't do any least square fitting to that. It's right off the bat, it's a hyperbolic cosine. I then took and hung weights off of that. And I distributed the weights, not uniformly along the length of the chain, but rather uniformly horizontally. And as soon as I hung the weights on there, that hyperbolic cosine transitioned right into a parabola. So the math works, the physics makes sense. We understand the basic curve of the suspension bridge, which is the basis that that parabola was the basis of the design and it was helpful to get where that was coming from. So where does this go? This is just a start of a journey. I'm learning more as we go along. The next thing to do is we're putting in, in force sensors into the cables so that we can figure out what the, do the forces follow the way we expect them to go as we go along. The idea is to build up our sophistication of the model as we go. Following along the path of Navier with the unstiffened bridge, then we add in stiffened bridges, then we have to go to elastic and deflection and eventually you're gonna end up where you are today. I don't know how far down that path I'm gonna get because the engineers have looked at this already and have a lot of uh, understanding. What I'm trying to do is get a first order physics understanding that would allow us to take these ideas and I can pop them into a classroom that makes for a great little, a quick laboratory exercise, which then takes us to where are we at now? We have a lot of questions. Paul, I don't know if you want to jump in and talk about some of these questions we're thinking about. Well, we can, so we can read these. So, you know, how does the catenary behave differently than a parabola? And how did making calculations based on catenaries affect the design of the bridges? And to some degree, you know, when we say these, we're really thinking when you're an engineer working in the 19th century, how did you look at these problems, right? How does the shape differ with and without the diagonal stays? how did the joints in the diagonal stays affect the behavior? So it may not have been so clear in the drawings, but the way those diagonal stays were made is they were multi-segmented iron bars and they have joints. Later on when Roebling did diagonal stays, which he did tie to the vertical suspenders on the Niagara Bridge, he's now using wire rope. And if you were to go to the Brooklyn Bridge, you'll see that as well, that the diagonal stays as well as the suspenders are made of wire rope. So even changing from a solid bar to wire rope is gonna change the behavior. A unique thing about French cables that we haven't talked about is that Roebling created his cables by spinning them in the air. And why that's important is that the French engineers created their cables out of multiple strands of smaller cables and they laid these cables horizontal and parallel on the ground, and then they lifted them up at the ends to put them in place. And when you lift a cable from the ends, you naturally create greater tension on the bottom of the cable and you sort of pinch the wires at the top. The problem being that the suspension cables that were done by French engineers did not have wires of equal tension. Therefore, they weren't all fully carrying an equal load of the bridge. 
So one of the significant things that Roebling did was he changed the way that we built suspension bridges. So he spun these cables continuously, a wire at a time, from the anchorages all the way across. And the result is because the wires were hanging in a curve close to the curve they would need when carrying a load, they hold equal tension, they run more efficiently. And today we still make suspension bridges the same way. The French cables also were tied periodically and the wires were sort of loose and Roebling wrapped them tightly. He also worked with groups of seven strands of cables, which he knew created a somewhat round form. But when you add that wrapping, we're curious, right? What does that do in terms of increasing the stiffness of the cable? And then other questions we have specific to the pendulums on the Monongahela Bridge, which is, you know, how beneficial were the pendulums in reducing the wear on the piers? One of the problems that we didn't get to specifically is that the pre-existing piers were only 11 feet at the top. And this is one of the reasons why Roebling looked towards iron towers on the top of the uh, cast iron towers instead of masonry. Actually, one of the advantages of using iron or any kind of metal in the towers is the towers have some inherent flexibility that does not exist right in a masonry tower. And most modern bridges, suspension bridges, we don't build with masonry towers anymore because they don't have that given flexibility. And there's, there's one more question I want to talk about, which is how did Roebling prevent the twisting of the pendulum at the first tower if the anchor chains are in a straight line and the suspension cables are inclined? And can we determine if the anchorage was splayed as it was at Niagara? So one of the things that came up was in conversation with some of my colleagues was I'm allowed one, um, one expression of incredible enthusiasm about my passion for Roebling per presentation. So this is it. So what's interesting about the Niagara Railway Bridge and you can see the Niagara Falls in the background is that he's got two suspension cables and if you look closely at the middle of the span, you'll see they're at, they're at different levels of deflection. And when they go backwards towards the anchorage, if you look at them, they almost look as if they're twisting on each other. And it has to do with their position. So this is part of the writings of Washington Roebling, which I'd like to read. The general arrangement of the two pairs of cables embraced ingenious details, not generally recognized by the engineers of the time. In place of hanging the vertical planes as they were inclined, the upper ones, much more than the lower pair, they also hung 10 feet above the lower ones. On the other hand, the anchorages of the upper pair were just behind and to the outside of the lower. This made it possible to have the resultant pressure of the two pairs of cables pass vertically down the towers without any side pressure, thus obviating the necessity of an upper connecting arch to sturdy them. Can we go to the next slide? So this is my drawing of the bridge to clarify some points. So if you look on the top image, you'll see the two suspension cables at a different height. And then you'll see that one anchorage is behind the other. And one of the important things that was done here was to make sure that the bridge behaved properly and equally in equilibrium during the expansion and contraction of the cables during temperature changes from the winter to the summer, the anchorage that is the further anchorage is actually for the upper cable so that the lengths of those cables is exactly the same so they act in equilibrium. And then if you look at the drawing on the bottom, which shows the plan of the towers back to an anchorage, I want you to notice that the anchorage is not at 90 degrees to the towers. Can you hit enter, Mari? So a couple more images. So keep hitting till you see one, two, and stop. One more, one more. Okay, so on the upper left hand, you're seeing what happens in the middle of the tower, right? So in the middle of the span on the left, you've got two suspension cables at inclined angles and they are gonna create resultant vectors that are different on the tower. And they had to be balanced in order that those two towers could stand independent and not be pulled from side to side. So the way that he did this, and if you look in plan, is the right-hand side are the inclined suspension cables passing across the saddle on the tower. And then as you go back towards the anchorage, not only are they one behind the other, right? They've angled them. 
So the reason I bring this up is that I wonder whether or not the method he's using here, if he did or didn't apply it to the Monongahela Bridge. So let's go to the next slide. So this is how I originally drew my anchorages for the Monongahela Bridge. You're seeing a plan view in the right and sort of a, it's sort of a section elevation on the left that's just lining up. But you'll notice that the way I've drawn the anchorages is they align at 90 degrees to the towers. So the, but the suspension cables are at an angle. So I know that the detail at that tower must be different than the other towers. And so the question is, how did Roebling account for that? And while I don't know the answer, nor do I know if I'll ever find the real answer, I do have some ideas about how he might have done it when I apply the methods I see him using at Niagara. So if he hit the next button, you notice how the anchorages have now shifted, right? So if they were splayed in a similar fashion to what he later does about 10 years later at Niagara, that would be one possible way to deal with those vectors and to keep them balanced. However, what's different here, and you can see in the next slide, right, is if you look at the towers, Roebling does have, right, a girder connecting these two towers. They are certainly not as tall as the towers on the um, Niagara Railway Bridge, which were about 60 feet tall. These are only about 15 feet tall. So we're not talking about the same degree of movement, but the girder is also allowing these to stabilize. Hit one more, right? So this is how it possibly looked. And the only other piece of evidence I have found so far, if we go to the next slide, is the first time I saw this perspective that was drawn by Roebling himself, it occurred to me that the perspective looked distorted. So if that is true, it would account for why the anchor chains look like they're further out if they really are indeed splayed. And so at some point, for my purpose of studying this and trying to conclude whether or not this might be a possibility, I'm going to try to recreate the same one point perspective and overlay it to see whether or not the anchorages are in a different position than shown in the perspective. So that's my, my one question of enthusiasm that I still have yet to answer. And so we would like to really open it up to any questions that anyone might have about any aspect of the bridge, the presentation and so forth, physics or history.